Robbie Knievel, hailed by his own father as the greatest daredevil to ever live. The first to conquer the fountains at Caesars. And the only man to ever jump the Grand Canyon. Shepard risk taker who has walked the line between life and death countless times, pulling the trigger on the most mind-boggling motorcycle jumps of all time, and lived. Until now, Robbie Knievel is an intrepid seeker of the unknown, a man who has traveled the world and experienced the unbelievable, searches the globe in pursuit of the biggest thrill of them all, to unlock the mysteries that have eluded mankind for centuries. Join us as we explore the unknown, Knievel's quest, Bigfoot. Bigfoot Seekers, I'm Warren. They call me Squatchy, because I've been searching for Bigfoot for most of my life, ever since I saw the Patterson-Gimlin footage on TV in 1967. Now, years later, my best friend, Robbie Knievel, and I get to go to Willow Creek, which is the town nearest Bluff Creek, where the infamous footage was shot. Robbie's been interested in Bigfoot for as long as he can remember, too, so hang on for the ride as we journey to Bigfoot Mecca. I just want to go to a place where I've had heard stories and had eerie feelings my whole life. I've never seen a Bigfoot. I've never seen a Sasquatch. But when you look from space at the earth and what God created with the ocean and everything in it and the mountains, the rivers, and the unknown and how fast I heard Bigfoots move and everything, I believe they're out there. And I had a friend, Doug Demoka Sawili King, take a picture of a footprint when he went on an expedition in Oregon and uh, you know I just always believed in them and I'd really like to see one because as big as they are they probably got a big heart and maybe I can sit down and have a drink with them I don't know folks at the Willow Creek Museum have invited us and it's the greatest Bigfoot Museum ever period and of course has the biggest Sasquatch wood carving that's just awesome it looks like the hairy man or the weeping man or the boss of the mountain I would just love to see a Sasquatch in the wild and I've seen film a few different films and pictures of Bigfoots and it's totally believable but I think it's my turn to go out after all the risks and all the things I've done like my dad it's time to go out and go on to man's quest and find and see and capture on camera Bigfoot and if I ever died I'd hope it'd be from a grizzly bear or a Bigfoot <laughs> you know I just want to go out I grew up in the trees I grew up everywhere you know, I just know they exist, and I just hope I get to see one.
some of the most professional Bigfoot friggin' seekers in the world with me. And I know more about Bigfoots than they do, so, you know, I'm definitely going to see one, have a beer with them, maybe a Twinkie, just so I can say I did. And if I don't get a picture of it, you know, you can take my word for it. I've been up in the Redwoods, seen my girlfriend, ex-girlfriend, went through there at like 2 in the morning in the Redwoods, and I was going like 30 miles an hour in my Jaguar, and there wasn't a car on the highway, Highway 101, and, and all we were doing was staring, looking for a Bigfoot all the way through the Redwoods, man. Never saw one. I'm going to see one this time. Humboldt County and all that, and the Bigfoot Museum I've never been to, so I'm really excited about that. And the, to meet the people that have had sightings, and to talk to them face to face, and know that they're for real. And I know if people are for real, because nobody knows people like I know people. I see right through people. Look at all these artifacts. Oh my gosh. This is showing us miners' tools, guns, weapons of the era, and more that put it more into perspective with your early Sasquatch accounts, which quite frankly, you don't even need to hear about new encounters because if you refer to Dr. Ivan T. Sanderson's book, The Abominable Snowman, Legend Come to Life, as well as John Green's work or any of the four horsemen, the most important guys from the very beginning of this who are part of the Tom Slick expedition, which include Grover Krantz, Rene de Hinden, John Green, and Michael Byrne. Those were the four horsemen of Bigfoot. And Mr. Tom Slick, who had previously done an expedition into the Himalayas, was fortunate enough with his activities to retrieve Yeti feces, which to this day maps out through its DNA as unknown primate. There is no registry of DNA for the Sasquatch creature from an ignorant race of science and academics. Because it's before, 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 and science and logic can never define the truly mysterious, the mystery of all creation, God's grace on earth. habitat for Bigfoot I have no clue I've heard they've been sighted in a lot of places but mostly the Northwest up to Alaska Canada the, the thick trees I think the thicker the better so I'm just hoping I have a little short acquaintance with one of them I hope it's a female because it might only last for two minutes <laughs> and then I could have a half big foot, a half, never mind. Now look for Sasquatch. We are looking. Shh, shh, look at, see this? Shh, 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 this is where they go. Shh, 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 this is where they would live. They would live up at the top of that because no wanna, human could do that. I just want to get the Bigfoot virus. And that would probably take, you know, some kind of shaking hands or something. Forget about coronavirus. I want the Bigfoot virus. Whoa! Now we're in a higher elevation, quasi-treacherous two-lane road. Well-maintained, I must say. But we see the high valleys and quasi-canyons that we've deduced that the Sasquatch may very well create its habitat or dwelling upon these peaks because perhaps they know that humans cannot traverse them while they can with relative ease. 
due to their musculature and stamina. Perhaps it has to do with their feet, which have the bitarsal break and leverage the weight of the Sasquatch in a different way than a human foot would. As we get closer and closer to Willow Creek, it's just so obvious why the Sasquatch would be here. Look, Rob, look at those mountains and the, the trees and... I'm feeling it, I'm feeling it. Unreal. 15 miles from Willow Creek. It's beautiful. the legendary Bigfoot Motel. It's full circle as it's the same motel that the Four Horsemen and members of the Tom Slick expedition stayed in 1959. I gotta take a big foot piss. <laughs> I'm gonna drop you off at the Bigfoot Bookstore, the famous, legendary Bigfoot Bookstore, to meet Steven Struffer and Robert from the Bluff Creek Group. They're gonna be our point men along with Rowdy on our expedition. We want you to meet both of them and hear about the area and, of course, the infamous Patterson-Gimlin film. I'm ready. It is pretty there, I have scorpion to admit that. Creek. Hello! There's probably scorpions there. Hello! Robbie Knievel. I've heard a lot of stories over the years. I'm a big believer. I want to see, I hope, this scary monster, this big foot, seven, ten foot tall. That's what I want to see. Well, you're in Willow Creek, the right place to go. You know, just south of Bluff Creek, where all the famous stuff happened. We can't take you to the film site because there's a closure on it right now. But the nice thing about the closure, that place stays wild for like up to eight months a year where pelvic access isn't there. So that means the animals have a place to go and hang out without people and allows the resource to come back. So he makes it more of a nice place for wild animals to hang out. Yeah, we're just looking at the map here, uh, the Bluff Creek area. We're always debating, we're looking at different access points, and we just got done talking about Laos Camp, or why they call it Laos Camp. Yeah, it's right in the bend of the creek there, it's where a couple creeks meet, and that's the traditional place where they were, when they were putting the roads back in, that was their main camp back in the uh, 58. Whose main camp? Uh, the loggers, when they were putting the roads in. That's Ground Zero Mecca of Bigfoot in uh, Bluff Creek. That's the Ground the Zero, huh? The Patterson film was shot, which is hard to see on here, but just up Bluff Creek, about right here, is where the Patterson film site is. I know it's just as far as you should get there real easy. Where is Willow Creek from there? Willow Creek is way down over here. How many miles? Maybe just like 25 miles. Is it steep oh, mountains, so. thick trees, Sasquatch land? Oh, uh, yeah. Stuff? I'd say yes on that. Well, this is where the film was shot. This is where those tracks were found in 1958. Okay. So, all of the uh, expeditions and stuff, the Pacific Northwest expedition in 1959 was based right there. So it's tradition for the Bigfoot hunters to go to this exact spot. Uh, and you're surrounded by mountains. This whole area is nothing but mountains. It's an old black and white shot. 
It has yeah. Tom Slick in it. He was one of the original guys who was funding the Pacific, what's that, Pacific Northwest. Yeah, uh, you can see that in the museum over there. Yeah. That's where they were posing at the firing at this it's place. Not like here. the Burning Man or nothing. No, definitely not like the Burning Man. I don't Man. think the Forest okay. Service would appreciate that. Okay. How far back you talk? Well, that photograph was taken in the 50s. Okay. Was it Stephen? Do you remember? Yeah, they made the, they made this camp here to be the base for the road construction. That's what I'm asking. So yeah, yeah 1958 is the classic year when they put the bridge in right here that says 1958 on it. Okay. It's also when they were making these brand new roads and they found all those Bigfoot tracks up there. Bigfoot was living undisturbed in here, you know, except for a few hunters and campers. There weren't these roads to even get in there. Hmm. Uh, they took it all the way across here to the top, and uh, you know that really opened the area up for a, logging uh, and other uses. Give me a mile radius around this well, ground these, zero. These little squares you I'm see on mile. the map, these are a, a mile. So one, two, so three, you're four, five, 20, six, seven, 20, ten to twenty miles. Well, are you talking about from Lost Camp to just the it, whole sorry. area? Well, around ground zero, which you call it. Wow, that's that could, it would cover more than just what we have here. But let's let's give you a distance from Laos camp, where it's the main central camp, where a lot of people utilize, to the film site, which is right about there. And each one of these is a section; it's a mile. So you go about one mile, okay, two miles. I see. So I'm looking at about a little less than two and a half miles as the raven flies from Laos camp to the film site. Is there mountains on this map? Yeah, it's, uh, it's topographical, so you can see the contour lines, but yeah, this oh, whole thing's the contour a contour lines, okay. Yeah. I see it. See, here's Bluff Creek. Right. And these are the headwaters. I mean, there's of mountains Bluff Creek. everywhere around here, but. Steep mountains. So there's yeah. a lot of water running yes. through here, all the way to the ocean. Yes, that dumps into okay. the Klamath out this way. Right. It goes in. So it. there's a lot of territory, hidden trees, thick, Bigfoot territory to go fishing all the way to the ocean. Yes. Okay, and yeah. that's why there's been a lot of sightings in this area, and they call that Ground Zero. Yeah, because uh, it's pretty close. It's the first established campground close to where uh, Bluff Creek is, so that's okay. why they're calling. That's why we call it Ground Zero. Okay, in 1958. Well, prior to that, actually, but that's when the uh, the Jerry Crew cast was cast in 1958. And what is that? You want to talk about that, Stephen? Jerry Crew was the guy who was driving the tractors, making the roads. So, you know, you'd have some loggers come out and cut the trees out, and then he'd bulldoze the rest. Okay. Uh, Cat Skinner. And he was bulldozing new roads up past this Laos camp place where uh, they started finding Bigfoot tracks in the new plowed dirt. Right. So he was the guy who brought the track down to the newspaper in Eureka. And Is that's that where how they got, it got all over the global news wire. You know, I've heard about casts of Bigfoot prints, and I am going to the museum, the Bigfoot Museum, and is this where they might have first found the first footprints? Well, this one, in this whole book, you got page after page of topographical maps, but this one page here uh, has almost all of the famous Bigfoot tracks found. In it, you know, from here uh, over to here where the Patterson film. Most uh, of them. <laughs> all of the, the, the most famous ones from the 50s and 60s were found right there. That's what I want to know. And they have copies of that over in the museum, so okay. you can see them there. Uh, in the drawers there, you can pull them out and see the actual original casts. Really? Uh, with the same sand on it, you know, the same Bluff Creek sand on the bottom of the track. Cool. Congratulations, you're now the proud owner of Sand from Patty's film site. This is from the film site, the Patterson film site. There's a quarter section where we found the film site area, relocated it. But the place where Patty kind of traveled through, this is sand from that ground where she would have walked. And you get your own sample. You know, that is really weird because my great grandmother used to collect sand from every beach she went to around the world. She lived to 103. And I haven't seen a bottle that size with something in it, like sand, since then. So this is cool. Thank you. Hey, you're welcome. Yeah, it's it's kind of nice. It's like it's like uh, the the sand is really fine, and some of the photographs you see, uh, 
of the, of the cast or whatever, it's kind of like a bluish hue to the, the, the sand. Mm -hmm. And that's because it's the, the parent material is kind of has a little bit of bluish coloring to it. I get it. It's really sticky and soft and it, you can just put your fingerprints on these and it, it really it really captures it. And you can do that right now. Go ahead and press your finger on that thing and it sticks to your hand, it's kind of gray. And if you look carefully at the oh, sand no, you just press yeah. into, you can actually see some of the grooves of your fingertips yeah. in it. And you can see it sticks. That's why it shows up gray on it. And it sticks right to your finger. So when Patty walked across and in the movie, you see her walking across and her bottom of her feet look kind of gray, it's because the sand is sticking to the bottom of her feet. Huh. You guys should maybe start your own Bigfoot FBI shows. Yeah, forensics. Oh, FBI yeah. forensics. <laughs> so we went to go find it. Uh, with Steve and I and Ian originally started looking for the film site. Uh, what helped us find it was kind of an aerial photograph, much like this one, where it was taken by Renee in 71. And you can see there's all these landmark artifacts like stumps, logs, uh, down is trees. A, is this the same place they took the uh, photograph of the Bigfoot? Walking out of the river. This is the same location in '67, um, and this was '70, oh, '71. This is taken by Renee De Hinden, who was investigating and doing follow-up, collecting evidence okay. afterwards. So he took the shot from the top of a hill to capture the whole film site area. Okay. And these artifacts line up with the old photographs and in, in the movie of of where it was. So what happened is over years, I think what 45 years before we started doing our investigation. This is now a forest. You can't see it. And you can't see from the top of a hill. It's all overgrown. So what we had to do is we had to go through and grid search a map, pretty much go through and find a north-south axis point, grid into 30-foot size grids. I know it sounds complicated, but we just we drew a map of all the logs and stumps and down materials that were there into a grid so we could find it. And then we took that grid and we compared it with an aerial photograph and we matched the artifacts that were in the photograph with the artifacts that we drew in our grid map. What artifacts? Artifacts would be like logs, oh, stumps, stumps the, uh, organic deposits. From the guys cutting trees way From back. the vegetation decaying over time. So here's this 1971. I'll put this back over here. And you have, 71, you have these dead logs, right? Right. These snags. Well, they're decaying now. And you can heart, and there are a lot of this organic material. But you can't go here on a hillside like Rene did in 1971 and take a photograph of this because it's overgrown. So we had to go on foot, cross the gravel bar, sandbars, and find a north-south axis point to draw a perfectly rectangular square grids. Okay. And then we drew into these grid the artifacts like logs and stumps in their position. You and guys should line up my ramps. Really? Well, this Go is ahead. where we were hoping you could do a jump right <laughs> yeah, over Yeah, right, here. jump to the hill side here. And so we did, after we got all that done, we ended up taking that information. That's where this map comes in. Let me switch this for you. And we drew this. Are you guys millionaires? Let's go back to the jump. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> so here is pretty much what we figured out where all the landmarks were drawn in according to the grids that we created. So we were able to duplicate it based on this right. and the artifacts. So we confirmed that this was the film site. Okay. Before people. Now, is Renee a guy or a girl? Renee is a guy. Okay. Renee de Hinden. I got an aunt Renee. I was just oh, wondering. yeah. And there was a, a Renee on Finding Bigfoot, too. Okay. So all the background cheese is what people were using originally trying to look for the big tree. The right. problem is there's a lot of big trees. Well, not a lot, but a few of them, and they were pretty deceiving. But they couldn't see the stumps and the logs that we have drawn in here because it was overgrown, and you couldn't find these. Right. And the only way to find it was to stumble around aimlessly and trip over them, but they're all covered with vegetation. So in the process of doing north-south angle lines, 30-foot grids, walking through systematically and drawing the artifacts, which are the stumps and logs, into position, going back and forth, we were able to create this map. And this map proved to some naysayers that, yes, this is the film site. Hmm. And people could point to all the big trees they want, but they did. didn't have these artifacts to tie in the big trees, and oh, that's what we Well, did. we were surprised about the most is that these things still exist. You know, these, these are all dead wood. Uh, stumps and log piles from a big, a big flood that washed through there in 1964. So it took out that whole sandbar, uh, which is now grown back, and left it like that with basically nothing living on it. You know, and you can see the trees are already starting to grow back there in 1971. So 
by uh, the 1990s, you know, nobody could find the darn place. But all of these things were like in a time capsule, preserved, you know, in the sand, not rotten away at all. No one had done any logging on the big trees. So uh, we were able to basically see this film site as it was when the film was shot by taking away all the new growth and just representing this uh, as it is. Right. It's all old. You know, even the living trees, we put a, a tree bore in there so we could figure out how many rings there were. You know, was this here in 1967 when the film was shot? Uh, that's how we figured that out. So we got a, a, a tree bore is a mechanical device that you bore into a tree. Right. Pull out the rings of the tree to estimate its age. So we estimated whether or not trees were here in 1971 when this shot was done. Which they could have been easily. Yeah, yes, yes. So uh, like we found out that the alder trees, which are fast growers. I know what they were. The, the bigger White, ones. Wider trees, yeah. And they were pretty much, they had lived about 35 years and then they die out. So none of the alder trees that were there were at the time. And then the firs were there, some of them. How, how long did the firs live on an average? It depends, they could live 250. And there's a lot of firs, right? Yeah, Different they could more than that even. Uh, some of them are white huge. White firs, Ponderosa firs. Yeah. So. yeah, mostly out here we have our Douglas firs, is predominant. Douglas firs, yeah, that's here's predominant. Yeah. Yeah. Well, this, some of them are huge. Like if you yeah. watch that Bigfoot movie, you can see that gigantic tree in the background. Right. And that's the one we were all looking for. You know, now, like, how long to compare to a redwood is that? Oh. Well, redwoods will outlast the Douglas firs. The redwoods wow. can live up to 2,300 years or more. Or more. Holy yeah. cow. Coastal redwoods. So Giant sequoias a lot longer. Bigfoot's living in the redwoods. There's tons of sightings reported <laughs> all the, from the redwoods all the way out here to Redding, you know. Right. Wow, I didn't know they'd live that long. At least the trees wise. We don't know how long Bigfoot's live, but the trees wise, yeah. Maybe we should do a tree documentary. <laughs> Well, if you're looking for Bigfoot, this is a good place to find one, you know? I want to build a tree house out <laughs> here and just live here. Well, that, that tactic might work, you know? They say if you go out there and live like a squatch and smell like a squatch, you will be less offensive to the squatch. You're more likely to see one. Got it. Yeah, it's a good place to look for Bigfoot. That's why we have all our trail cameras here, you know? Uh, set up all around the area. Uh, to monitor 24-7 uh, all year round whether there's uh, any Bigfoot activity. Okay. And so project's been going since the fall of 2012. Hmm. And it went to 2020 now, so it's been quite well, a long time. The bookstore here in Willow Creek. How long has it been here and how many books about Bigfoot and how to get established and why? So I opened this store in 2005. Okay. And. Uh, I called it Bigfoot Books, you know, just because it seemed like a cool thing to do out here in Willow Creek. Since we have the Bigfoot Burger and the Bigfoot whatever, everything. Hotel, yeah. Um, and uh, so Bigfoot researcher people started coming in here thinking, well, it's a bookstore. It's got to be a source of information or whatever. All right. So since then, uh, that that's what I've been more and more drawn into doing is talking about Bigfoot every day. I want to get my own still shot of Bigfoot with yeah. me. We like to think this is the real place to look, you know, the, the best place to look. Right. From here up into Washington. Uh, yeah. the most solid habitat. Oregon, Washington, right. yeah. the Great I mean, Northwest, the Great Bigfoot Mountains mm -hmm. and trees. Yeah. Hideouts, but you know, caves, like, everything. Back in Ohio and those parts of the country, the trees and the deer and all the other things are coming back, growing and growing, and more and more Bigfoot sightings are reported out there. You know, Florida too, down in Texas, I mean, all over the country. You've heard of the terms, the, the term skunk ape. That's a Florida thing, so it ties in yeah. Florida. Stinky. Yeah, but smelly. Like get away, out of my way. Get away from me. Get out of my territory. The yeah, smell could, that they put off. It could very well be that. Because you're, you're, on, you're on, the, on your expeditions, we're going out, we walk around the forest, and every once in a while you catch a pocket spell of something really stinky, and it, in the back of your mind you're always going, is that a skunk? Or, right. or I've been followed, or is that Patty? But if you really want the Bigfoot action, you want to get out there into Bluff Creek, you know, a place like that where it's really wild. I'm hoping I'm going there. 
So there is a place we, we can we can't get you all the way to the film site, but we can, we can take you to a place where Bluff Creek puts into the Klamath River. And there's it's kind of a interesting place. We'll take you there. We also have a camp nearby, and we got a fire ring. We kick back a little bit. Maybe tonight we can go out and do some some knocking or, or some calling, and we'll see what happens. Maybe we get some action out there. That sounds. Uh... A little bone chilling, but I'm ready. Let's go before it gets dark. Got you on that one. Man, let's go. I want to. I'm getting a chill. On the way to the infamous Bigfoot Museum, we get word from Steve, Rowdy, and Robert of the Bluff Creek Group that they've got a retired parks employee who had an amazing face to face encounter with a Sasquatch close to where the Patterson Gimlin footage was shot. I'm Dick. Dick. Hello, Dick. Nice to meet you. You all three look like characters. <laughs> <laughs> Where we are now, it was so full of smoke that you know, the street lights were on in the middle of the day. We had driven our truck, a Forest Service truck, uh, up Highway 96, and we had stopped at the ranger station in Orleans. This is before there was radios in the truck and any of that stuff. So we knocked on the door and told them where we were going. And uh, they asked us if we had a camera. And yes, we did. And we had a good camera. And so they asked us to, to please stop and take a photograph or several photographs of a place where there had been some illegal logging and the, the theft of a couple of uh, Port Orford cedar. And my partner and I got up there, and we had other things that we wanted to do as well as take pictures. All the time I was there, I had this feeling, you know, you get the feelings, yeah. I get the feeling. Somebody is up here watching me. But I'd look around and I could never see anything. Uh, so I took a whole roll full of 36 shots. Great. And um, my partner came back with the truck and it seemed pretty much like lunchtime to us. So we had some nice fresh water and blackberries or blueberry, blackberries mm -hmm. for lunch. All right, we just gobbled them up. I love them. And uh, went on and walked maybe a mile and a half, did all of our uh, measuring and all, of the, all the stuff that we had to do mm -hmm. and came back and my partner was driving and, and we're on this really narrow road I mean, it's maybe 12 feet wide, maybe 15, but, right. but you know, not a two-lane road at all, and it's a dirt road. And uh, all of a sudden, he's got his foot on the floor, and he said, son of a bitch, look at that. And, you know, we're on this really narrow road, and he's got this truck up to about 25 miles an hour, which is pretty damn fast. And on that said, road. Yeah. yeah. And I said, where? And he said, right straight ahead. And he's got the truck aimed right at this big stump where we ate lunch. And there's a, a head and shoulders that came up from behind the stump and uh, took one look at us. And then, so if I'm, I'm facing you and this thing turned around like this, and looked back up the road the way we were going, not where we were coming from. And then turned around and it ran up an old uh, skid trail. On two feet or four? Two feet. Okay. Okay. And we figured out that, hey, that thing wasn't any bigger than, you know, it's not 10 feet tall. It's not anything like, it's no, no taller than we were. When we stood behind this stump again, our heads and shoulders were the same height as that head, guy's head and shoulders. Mm -hmm. So we think, ah, it must be a small one. You know, they don't, they got to grow in order to get to be eight feet tall. And then we measured the distance that this thing ran. And it was, we had a long tape, so it was 120 feet. And that's uh, how far we could see it go into the woods. Did it run fast? Maybe four seconds, maybe four and a half wow. to cover 120 feet. You can check that out and compare it with what a. I NFL. used to run that in track. No. Yeah. No, you can see how, how yeah. that, that's what an NFL. But it wasn't like you he was lineman run. Afraid of you guys. But oh no. Wanted to get away. Uh, what we thought was that this is a young one, 
when he turned around to, to look away from us, he was looking for a sign from his mother. Or he or she was looking for, you know. We could not tell what sex this thing was. Right. And uh, then it turned around and, and made it up the hill. Huh. Yeah. And so you watched it go up the hill. Yeah. And we also had this tape. We were, uh, at the closest, we were 60 feet from it. So we weren't 500 feet away. And, you know, and it was uh, a reddish brown color. Was his face all hairy or was it bald face? <sighs> Looked a lot like a chimpanzee to me. Mm. You know, that's, that, if I had to say, describe it. So it was all real quick. And oh, yeah, yeah. You know, maybe five, six seconds total. Huh. But that's a long time when you're yeah. looking at it. Oh, yeah, I know. It takes me four seconds to go over the long jump, it seems like forever. <laughs> got Bobo here, too. He's had, what, five, four? He's had a few. Sightings? Yeah, actual sightings he's had himself. I've had the feelings, and I've never saw any. My mother still says she saw a UFO in the 70s, like plain as day. You know, there's just, there's a quest for all men, dreams, whatever you got. Whether you got a dream or you want to know about something, some people don't care, but I care. Well, I'm really looking forward to just a few days here, and it was really nice talking to you guys. Pleasure, and I hope to see you again. Okay. Really. Nice to meet you. You too. Let's head over to the Bigfoot Museum, where Bobo and Steve are waiting to show us artifacts and evidence, further supporting the Bigfoot sightings in the area. Creek, China Flat. Am I at the Bigfoot Museum? I hope. I'm looking for Bobo. There's Bobo. I see Bobo. Bobo, see Robbie. Hey, the captain, nice to meet you. Nice to see it. Yeah. Just hanging out at the Bigfoot Museum. I want to see it. There's a whole separate room for Bigfoot. Want to check it out? Of course I do. After you, Steve. The classics back here. This is the real gold zero, the original Bigfoot cast and tracks. This should all be in the Smithsonian, but they don't recognize the Bigfoot yet. So it's here. But this is the, the best stuff in the world. Holy really cow. Bigfoot history. Tell me about these. Uh, Steve knows about these ones. Jared Carew. Yeah, in 1958, these were the first ones that got on the AP Newswire and went all across the world. And it's where the name Bigfoot became popular. These were the first ones that were documented in the area that weren't just uh, rumors or ancient legends. Well, yeah, because Jerry, they said, oh, those drunk loggers are seeing things up in the woods. And Jerry said, drunk, he's a teetotaler, you know, Sunday school <laughs> teacher. So he got some casting material uh, and he cast that. And that's what he came back with. And they took the picture and went globally, you know, around the world. It was only. 21 years later, I jumped in writing. Yeah? Did you land it? Yes, I did. It was a short jump, though. 10 trucks. I was only 17. Mm -hmm. This is the area where the, those tracks were found, up on this mountain here, and uh, Bluff Creek down below in the film site for the Patterson films, right in there. The Patterson films, tell me real quick what that is again. It was the first photographic evidence of a Sasquatch, and it's still the best piece of footage got to this day. It's just an amazing piece. They got some stuff over here on it. Well, that's the Bigfoot from it right behind you there. That. Oh, yeah, there. that's the one, yeah. That's it. Everybody knows that picture. Yeah. Is that a female or a male? Oh, that's a female. Look at the Hooters. How do you know it's a female? Oh, the Hooters. <laughs> She does have hooters. Big time. Huh. No couch. Obviously never wore a bra either. Wow. She's I always cool. thought it was a male. She's ugly. She's beautiful. <laughs> Those are casts from Patty, the subject in the film. Those are casts made. Patty LaBelle? No, Patty the Squatch. <laughs> Patty Lay Squatch. Really? 
Yeah, that, those are the footprints that um, were cast afterwards. Left and right. Why do they call her Patty Swan? Because Patterson. Film. Roger Patterson. They call my manager was the guy who shot the movie. Patty Lasquachi. Yeah. <laughs> Dudical. Yep, that's the man right there, Roger. It's a it, it's a testament to him that he even got the footage on even ground in cowboy boots trying to hold that camera. It's amazing he got any footage at all. There would be no footage. There's about 10 more of them we got in the storage over here. And these are a lot smaller than those other ones in that other case. But you saw much bigger than we think is a male. These are the female. So there's a good chance that they could have been a breeding pair or related somehow. Because the tracks were found nine years apart, but same area. When you see these other casts around here, you'll see what the researchers look for was the flat, if they found a track where they looked for the flattest, most even one, whereas, but for the anatomist, it's what's really great is we see the uh, the flexibility of the foot and how it pushes, so you know it's not made by someone with a wooden foot. Wow, these are incredible. Well, there's the famous sort of mid-tarsal break that Jeff What's Melvin the biggest one you got? This one? Um, well, you know what's funny is that it could be, there's, We've seen uh, trackways where it goes from 14 to 18 inches in the same trackway because their foot's so flexible and like their foot's like almost like a hand. It's a, kind of more like a chimp it has like you know you have a ball on your foot where your toes bend. They have another ball further back from that, a couple inches back, so their foot bends twice. It's huge. Yeah, that's big. Holy moly, these are big feet, big foot. That's where they got the name. It's not like, <laughs> you know, the ape from years ago. Oh, no. It's like these are huge, like a strange primate, whatever. The biggest that ever lived. If it's Gigantopithecus, it's the biggest primate that ever lived for sure. A lot of people theorize that Sasquatch is a leftover remnant uh, from the Jack Gigantopithecus black eye. They found them in Vietnam and China. They found teeth and bones, some molars, um, jaw bones. And from that, they're able to reconstruct that skull. <clears throat> yeah, and this here was cast by a deputy Hereford up in Grays Harbor, Washington, back in 1982. It's considered one of the best tracks I ever got, if not the best. You can really see the foot morphology, the bone. How you can see that double ball, like the first ball and the second ball. That's the mid tarsal break. I see what you're saying there. Yeah, it's huge. Um, and then the other thing you look for in these tracks is that if it's living flesh. They call it the mushroom effect, like um, if it was wooden cut out, it would stay solid, like you'd have the same depth. But these ones, you'll see it's living flesh because they flatten out like real pads. They have a padded foot. That's what you're seeing there. Okay. But you know, you can see that the toe is up in the front, not on the side like an ape. So uh, it's a different species from either human or apes. That's what we're looking at. They're their own trip. But I'm not telling you anything you don't know. I'm sure you learned all that in medical school. <laughs> I think I'm kind of a doctor, but this is amazing. And uh, I, I really thank you guys for showing me this. This is really cool. How many times are you breaking your feet? You know what? I have the weakest feet in the world. And they're, you know, size nine and a half. Little guy. Shoot, yeah. No, my feet. <laughs>
we're looking at here are some hairs that were gathered in Hoopa Valley about 20 something years ago. I didn't know they found any hairs. Yeah, these are authenticated. Well, they're, they're not, they're unknown primate. Because when you put them under an electron microscope, they all have like unique platelet structures. They send them off to the labs, they compare them to everything, and nothing else matches it. And all Sasquatch, whether it's white, black, brown, red, when you look at it, when you put it under the electron microscope, it all, it all looks red. Really? The hollow shaft where your DNA is contained, like that's when they find human hair, they can get DNA off it sometimes, mitochondrial. This stuff is solid shafts, so there's no mitochondrial DNA. Hmm. These hairs are identifiable by the type of animal. They could be human, but if they don't have the traits of human hair, it's not bear hair, it's not dog hair, it's, okay. uh, it, it's most likely not human hair. So what is it, is the question. The woman saw the Bigfoot before it took off, and the cops came out. This was actually gathered by the local fire chief. Um, they responded to a 911 call. And when was this? Yeah, this is about 20 years ago. So this could be from an alien. With it's hair. possible. I've never seen an alien with hair. Do aliens have hair? <laughs> now these are interesting, because this gave the anatomists and anthropologists a lot of information on how the bone structure of the foot was. So, and then with this track next to it, they were able to map out the bone structure of the foot, and also look at it, and it matched exactly with the cast. You see like the mid-tarsal break and all that. Now this guy that found these originally was a hoaxer, but there was a thousand prints like this spread out over the side of the mountain. And look how big that is. You can see your lifeline. My honor. Oh, you did a long one to go. Damn it. I don't think there's Damn any you. dermal ridges on this no. one. Too bad you can't predict Bigfoot's lifeline. This it's looks just... like Block Creek sand right here. This is, these are paddy tracks. These are from the same track right you saw those other tracks. What's great about these is you see the the total difference, how it's not a wood cutout. I mean, it's obvious, like it's a living, flexible foot. Well, this is what they call cripple foot, mm -hmm. because of that one there is yeah. like, like a club foot. Yeah, wait, it was a 68, uh, 69. Big v 69, yeah. I mean, you're talking about legends that have made its way into movies so much farther down the line. I'm glad my daughters love me, because there's a legend of Knievel. These amazing artifacts can't be underestimated. The photos, the hair samples, the casts, and of course the Patterson-Gimlin film itself would be enough to convince a jury. But it's the eyewitness encounters that take it to another level. Next, we rush over to the Trinity River, where many sightings have occurred. Who's this guy? I'm Rob. Travis. Good Travis, to meet you, Rob. Nice to meet you. Yeah, you as well. So have you ever seen a Bigfoot? <laughs> yes, I have, in fact. You're kidding. I am not. It was wow. in 2005. Kind of met everybody. We were going to camp out, you know, this logging road in Southern Oregon. Um, and they put food out and the whole, you know, everything that the Bigfoot folks do. And uh, two things kind of walked downhill and started throwing pebbles at us. The creatures? The Bigfoot? I, guess, I mean, I didn't see them at the time, but something was up there. Throw right. little pebbles down. So that was unusual. <laughs> did you ever actually see one? I though? did. The next morning, um, everyone was still asleep, but my friend shook me awake and said he heard something back by where we put the food. So I said, well, let's go look. And he had actually woken up before me and seen sort of a gorilla type head um, through the trees. He turned, I was looking uphill, and you know, I see him out of the corner of my eye turn and up it goes. As I'm looking, I saw a Sasquatch, and it took three steps up and away from me, and it was kind of a reddish brown and just enormous. Um, the first two steps, it had its arms way up like that, and I could see like the muscles of the shoulder and its huge bicep. And then on the third step, it started to put its hands down, and then it was just gone. Huh. And so I walked back and was blown away, and uh, when everybody. I can picture this. I gotta see what. I think I probably would have convinced myself that I was mistaken if I hadn't seen the footprints. And they were up a steep hill where I could match sort of the stride. But yeah. it's so steep I couldn't take a step up from that. I ain't chasing them. 
I'll go hide out and wait for them. All right, Bobo, you showed me a lot of landscape and river, and I was wondering what uh, if you ever caught any rainbows or anything. I've caught a few salmon and steelhead. I don't fish the rivers much. I'm more of an ocean guy, but this is great fishing, and there's actually a really good run right now. There's a big steelhead run and some salmon also. So steelhead and salmon. Yeah. So no that, rainbow, really? Oh, there's, there's a few other trout in here, but the, the main, what people fish here is salmon and steelhead. So they're running I right now. Fishing. Yeah, so the Bigfoot's actually capitalize on that. They come when the, not so much the rivers, they'll hit them in the little bit of the rivers. When they go up the feeder streams, they'll get them in the, when they get up in shallower water, they pick them off when, they're, when the fish are laying their eggs. Really? Yeah. Everyone says, where's the bones? You might have seen a Bigfoot bone, we wouldn't know what it was. It looked like a cow bone, unless you saw the skull. Right. So what is a Bigfoot? Has anybody ever seen any Bigfoot droppings or boop? I've found it a few times, yeah. It looks like human, usually, but way thicker, and it's uh, maybe up to two inches in circumference. Well, that's amazing. I mean, you have pictures of... I got a few pictures of some scat, yeah. I mean, they're living, breathing animals. I mean, they leave scat, they leave hair behind, they leave, you know, footprints. I mean, they're a physical being. We'll go out and do some howling, some knocking. You know, it's, it's like 70 degrees right now, but it's supposed to snow later what on What do you mean today. knocking? You go to a tree with a stick and just... Take this and just crack. Maybe do like two or three. matter what kind of stick? Or? Hardwood's better. Yeah. Sounds more natural. Yeah, we've used baseball bats or clavas, you know, like from the drum kit, stuff like that. My great grandma gave me the inside of a vein cane that was so hard, I could have knocked a Bigfoot out with it. I know you've had some amazing encounters, you know. Tell me about some of them. Um, they've been mostly downriver from here. This is the Trinity River. And you flow a little bit north, you're in Tupa, and that goes for 12 miles, and then you get to Witchpeg. And up from there is Bluff Creek, the next uh, couple drainages up. So up from there up is where I've had most of my stuff all happen. I had two sightings up there on Bluff Creek. I had my only daylight glimpse up there. It was just like a half second. I saw half the body stand out behind a tree. What happened was I was with my buddy. We were going squatching. Squatching is just watching squatches. Is the going looking for squatches, right? Yeah, it's the act of searching for Sasquatch. Okay. So we were squatching and um, it was so hot, we thought, well, we'll just go down Bluff Creek and we'll walk in the water and just kind of rock hop and swim through the deep parts and, you know, just have a, just enjoy the day, get out of the heat. Never think there's, never think of Bigfoot would be out in the heat of the day because, you know, they're big, heavy, hairy animals. They're, they're mostly out at night. So I thought there's no way they're out in the daytime. We started getting knocks, tree knocks, and whistles then rocks, like big rocks like this coming out over trees like that size, flying over the trees, coming out and landing in the creek behind us. Never too close to us, like always like 50 feet away, 30 feet away. I had was an audio recorder. I thought, well, at least I'll get the whistles and knocks and maybe if it screams at us or something, I can record that. So I jammed back to camp, had my little dog monkey with me. <laughs> and she was sitting looking back where we came and I was re reaching down to get my recorder stuff underneath the seat when I did that. I had long hair at the time, I kind of cascaded down. But I saw her alert, like just tighten up and her ears go forward and, and I just started to glance and I just see this tall, skinny, black, leaning out behind a tree, just the whole left half of the body. Like one eye straight down. Huh. Really, really thin but with a broad chest, like tapered. V, v chest, but it, no muscle tone at all. Like, then I saw one a year later at um, nighttime, and Robert, uh, Robert the Ranger, that's with us now, him and another guy had heard this Bigfoot moving around coming in towards the camp, and another guy and I myself didn't know about it. We'd walked past him down the old trail in the dark. Uh, we were going to walk down to the bend so I could do a call down to the next canyon, and this thing tried to cross behind us. We thought it was another guy with us because it looked, he's like a kind of buff weightlifter guy. So we turn around and look, we see, we thought it was our buddy Bart. He's like a kind of buff guy. We thought it was him. We're going, Bart, 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 is that you for like five minutes? We're looking at it going, what is going on? And then it just crossed the trail. People talk about how they're real smooth. Like you don't see like a bobbing up and down, just like a glide. They're almost floating sort of, but it just walked across. And I didn't realize this at the time, until it happened, when we walked back there and saw where it crossed, it's that part, we could hear it climbing up the cliff and crossing the road to go up on the mountain. And we're like, we walked back and there's Bart and Robert hiding in the bushes with the night shot camera, hoping the thing walks up. This was at night? Yeah, it was at night, pitch black. And, yeah. and uh, so what I realized was, 
that when I saw the daylight the year before, it, it somehow snuck, when I turned away for a second, it, it took it off, it jammed up that way. I went up there, I smelt this, the most powerful smell. You always hear about the Bigfoot smell. I've always smelled it a few times, but that was the most thickest one. You could walk back and forth like through a 10 foot cloud and walk two feet past it. You didn't smell nothing. It just hung there because there was no wind at all, still. It, we think they have a secretion glands like other apes, great apes, like how we smell there too. It's right. great for them, like, like a skunk, like when they get agitated or mad or upset. The Native Americans up there on, on the peninsula we're talking about, almost like a piss and vinegar, a yeah. really strong smell. We think that we think that they do like a skunk thing where it excretes out of their really, yeah, that out makes of their sense. armpit area, because that's what gorillas and orangutans and stuff like that say the same thing. And it's a warning to other other animals, like I'm upset. Huh. So when the, that day, the year before in the daylight, when I saw the tall skinny one. I tracked it down right where that went across behind us, and there was this trail. Because we used to walk down this old Bluff Creek Road all the time. And you'd always look down in the creek, and the other side I was just like, you know, from here to the truck with uh, brush and trees. I tracked it, and I'd never looked to the side to the right because there was just like 30, 40 feet of brush and some small trees, and then like a vertical dirt cliff about 30, 40 feet as Onion Mountain Road goes up there. So I'd never even looked over there, and I realized there's this like, 10 foot, nine foot, four foot wide trail, wide Bigfoot highway. I'd walked by it hundreds of times and never noticed it. That thing had gone up there. Bigfoot highway? Yeah, you'll find these things out sometimes in the woods and they're, they, they'll, they're just cleared out the whole way through, like eight, nine, 10 feet up and four, four foot wide. If you ever find one of their nesting sites, they'll never use it again. I think once you get hit to their trails, they quit using them for the most part. Huh. They get overgrown again. But I know where there's one that's still up, but it's up in the snow above the snow line. We couldn't get to it. If you come back in the summer, we could hit it. Oh, I'll be back. <laughs> Especially if I don't see a Bigfoot. <laughs> I'll be here. But just down river this way, the Klamath, the Klamath River the river's down there, and the Trinity runs into it, and then you get down. That's like a hot spot zone there, which it radiates off from of Bluff Creek up to the Redwood National Park. There's like a 10 mile radius that there's where I had most of my Bigfoot stuff happen. Mm. I've never had anything happen on this side, but uh, people do all the time. I just don't spend much time here because there's a lot more people but here. You've heard from people that oh, yeah. have sightings all right over. Right here. Yeah. People have seen them right there. People have seen them all around here. They're on these hills right here, crossing the road right there. I was riding horses up by the trailheads to go up to Emerald Sapphire Lake up in the Trinity Alps, right above the Trinity Alps Resort. We was just riding along and then the horses didn't want to go. And, and them horses were born and raised up there too and stuff, so they wasn't scared of the bears or nothing like that. We had them on the property all the time. Just pretty much seen something going up the hill and it actually had a butt, you know, like a bear, you know, like don't have a butt. Standing upright, going up through the brush, over seven foot. It's in the middle of the day. Kind of made your hair stand up and real eerie feeling. But we always got this, you know, because we did a lot of packing back up in the Trinity Alps and, and, and it's big, real rugged country pretty much like here. When we was kids, you always hearing stories about them throwing rocks at people and whatnot, like too big of boulders for a human to throw. There was a time when uh, Dad, he, he um, was not really a believer in anything that wasn't real. And he seen the tracks, big old strides, that like four foot strides. And uh, the weird thing with it is, is that it was in, uh, it wasn't like how a person walked. You know, with two feet, it was like one foot after another in a straight line. He saw the tracks, and his girlfriend and I, she, she went and hid in the camper, and um, he really believed that it was there. But we we seen something. We're in the zone right now, half mile from town. Huh. But up there's where I had that's where I had my scary encounter, where I had my first my first where I for sure knew it was a bigfoot and nothing else. I didn't see it that night, but I got around here. Yeah, just right down that ridge line. Fall that ridge line down about 12, 15 miles. So is that, is it the most sightings have been in this area that you know of in the United States? Is that why they did the Bigfoot Museum, the Bigfoot Motel? No, that, this actually isn't really, I mean, it, it's a hot spot, but it's more a historical hot spot. It's because Bluff Creek's here in the first cast came out of here then the PG film Power Chicken Moon film the first seven. footprint cast yeah it came out of here that's where the word Bigfoot originated from the newspaper out of Eureka here in Humboldt and then the PG film nine years later really put that's what really put us on the map so that's what's always brought people here is like a mecca spot but 
Um, there's more sightings. Uh, you don't get as many vocalizations here. They don't, they're quieter up in that area. They don't do the loud screaming and yelling like other parts of the country. Um, it, believe it or not, if you want to really hear a Bigfoot, probably the best spots to go would be like uh, East Texas and the pine thickets there where it's kind of swampy. Up in Michigan and uh, like West Virginia, those areas, they vocalize way more back there for whatever reason. I had my best setting not far from there over in the Apache Reservation, the Hickory Apache Reservation up mm -hmm. in Four Corners. Right. I had my best setting there in 2004. I didn't know I was looking at a Bigfoot though. I had a night vision around my neck. There's with a bald eagle. Yep. Alaskan pigeon. That's a good sign. Always. All right, Bigfoot next. <laughs> it's a precursor. <laughs> See that? The bald eagles follow me around. I was doing a jump at a casino in Washington, Nooksack. Oh yeah. And um, a, they gave, they had me an eagle club made with a head. I'll show no you later. Way. It's in my bus. Yeah. Dude, that's for Chiefs. And and uh, yeah, and feathers hanging off it. Three feathers, because I wear three feathers. They did that on purpose, I guess. But the day I jumped, a bald eagle was flying around, and the. Indians, Native Americans, they just thought that I was something because of that eagle flying around. Right. You know, that meant a lot to them. 20 of them told me after the jump, did you see that eagle flying around? No wonder you made it. Well, what'd you jump? <laughs> I jumped uh, 150 slot machines. <laughs> All stacked up, three rolls of them. That was, that was a good looking jump, yeah. Class, or it was close to 30 cars. Funny story. So, when Rob jumps the Grand Canyon, you know, just looking over there, you want to Ralph. But anyway, he does it. It's amazing, and he goes too high and too far, and then he hits a bump. So we get these emails. Yeah, well, you guys should have leveled it out and all this stuff. And they're so clueless because yeah. we did not move a speck of their land, wow. which is our honor. Why didn't you tear the box oh, the bump, out? The bump over there, and then the hay bales, what do you get? part of the yeah. canyon, you right, know? Right, you can't right. just tear it out. How far he, was that jump? Uh, that was the longest jump I ever did. It's 231 feet. Yeah, 231. It's hardcore. Three times as high, three times as far, you land three times as hard. Right. It's a whole nother thing, you know? Right. And God bless his dad, buried in the story, but his dad jumped XR750. Dude, when he yeah. jumped on his Insane. Oh, I know, I know. I mean, my dad's gaps were usually 80 feet. Right. His practice gaps 90 or 150. It, the longest right. jump my dad ever tried was on the 650 tramp at Caesars, 120 foot gap. And when I jumped there, it was tighter takeoff, tighter landing, but I right. went 150. I remember I saw that. Up in the Olympic Peninsula, they've got spots like these big oxbows in the rivers with deep pools where they've seen groups of juveniles, Bigfoots, in daylight go out there, swim, corral the salmon, dive in and, and catch them. As soon as one got, as soon as one grabbed one, they'd get out of the water and run away and like not share, just run up on the bank and eat it raw. They'd do it till there's only two or three of those Bigfoots left and then the fish would get away so they wouldn't get one, but they normally get the salmon and steelhead when they go up into the feeder creeks where it's a lot shallower. They can just walk out and get them in knee deep water on the gravel bars. Right. On the river, when they first, the salmon start coming up, they don't lay one on the bank. I mean, it doesn't happen. There's not always a Bigfoot there watching. I mean, there's a lot of places they're fishing, but they still to this day will put the first big salmon up on the bank as a gift and say, this is for you. I still hear about to this day, they'll get big rocks and splashing them. And if they don't do it then, when if they still keep fishing and don't, because they won't push it past that. They're not going to come attack you. They'll make, they'll make you think they're going to. They'll scare you real bad. And if you don't, if you don't do what they want, which is give them the salmon, then when you leave, they're gonna pull your net out and pull every salmon out and leave your net so you're not catching overnight. Really? Yeah. Huh. Yeah, I, I know about the gill netters and all that stuff, but out in the Puget Sound, the Straits. And uh, I just, you know, I, I only heard a couple stories, but enough to make me you know, <laughs> believe right. things. Oh, yeah. It's just like you tell me stories, all the research and years you've done things. I cannot not believe it. We don't know exactly what they are, but we know they are there. And they're big. They can get huge. Yeah. I saw a 10 footer up down this, down of, outside of Witchbeck up there in Bald Hills. That was the first one I saw back in 2001. And it, it was gigantic. I mean, the shore, I mean, I remember looking at it going, how could this not be discovered? How, how could this not be in a zoo or a body or, like it, it was so, it's the biggest thing in North America. It's the biggest right. land animal in North America. How was I can, think of is 
they're so fast and high. Yeah. And I was going to ask you, like in the hot weather, do you think they go hang out in caves in the mountains? Yeah. I mean, if, is there a lot of caves around here? Oh yeah, there's a, definitely there's a lot of caves. There's a, there's pretty extensive cave systems out here, and there's plus there's a lot of old mines. Oh okay, and they mine. are all over underneath the ground, all like over. where I grew up in the mining town in Montana. Yeah, see, in those places where it gets really bitterly cold, they, they utilize the old I've mines. been down in them underneath in the mountains, and we used to do that as young kids, go in there and, you know, with flashlights and right. look around. And I mean, big, huge mining tunnels in the mountains. You know? How dangerous does that seem now? Oh, scary. I but, know. You know, we were young and having fun. I it, it was like a challenge. Let's go in the mines tunnels, man. If your 10-year-old kid was <laughs> going into the mines, and I'd be like, get the hell out of there. Yeah. Yeah, I, now I wouldn't even want to go in there. Right. So the natives have coexisted for thousands of years with these. They have a very deep body of knowledge of Sasquatch behavior. And they have a, you know, not a complicated relationship, but like an established relationship, you know, like don't shine lights on them, don't shoot at them. Um, when they come up and say, hey, I'm here now, it's time for you to leave. Uh, a lot of places, it's the Indians at daytime and at nighttime it's the Sasquatch. They've got to leave by nightfall. They can go gather medicine there, but they have to leave when it's, before it's dark. Mm. Why? Because that's the Sasquatch, and it's their turn for them to come down and feed and hunt right. and gather medicine. Oh, okay. Huh. Um, bears have been, bears not frequently, but have been known to come up, bite the net, and back up and drag the net up onto the bank if there's like enough room. But they don't like, you can tell it's a bear then, but when it's a Bigfoot does it, they pull it hand over hand like, like we do, and they make a pile of the net there. So mm. that's how they know the difference. Mm. Ooh, the Indians are yeah, all natives. Because only, only natives. <laughs> now I know. <laughs> only only natives can fish the rivers with gill nets. So hey. they're, they're the ones. That, they're the only ones that have this experience. Bo, thank you for answering some more questions, and I'd like to ask you some more in different places, where, wherever we go in the next couple of days. All right. And uh, I really appreciate it. That's rough. Thank time, you. Brother. Thank you. All right. Let's go. I'll show you some more spots. Sounds good. When you experience the vastness of this part of Northern California firsthand, it's easy to see how a bipedal hominid can not only survive in these woods, you get the idea that they could thrive here. Let's travel along with Bobo as he shows us the passage to the infamous Bluff Creek area that Roger Patterson and Bob Gimlin traversed in 1967. All right, Robbie, this is where the mighty majestic Bluff Creek flows into the mighty majestic Klamath River. This is it. I mean, that mountain. This is like Sasquatch land. It is. I know a guy that seen a female that sat up there at night, would sit up there and look out, ran into it up there multiple times. That's a good hideout. It totally is. And the river's so deep. Oh, yeah. Giant sturgeon in there. Lots of salmon, steelhead. Steelhead, salmon, everything. Washington, Oregon, everywhere, but I've never been here. And this is just like Sasquatch country. It is. And when it gets dark, you better camp out with me. I'm gonna. Dude, this is your- You wanna go camping? Let's do it. <laughs> That's an Dude, old joke. This is the Mecca. <laughs> Dude, this is the Mecca for Bigfoot. This is where people come from all over the world. Dude, I, I've met people here from all over the world, people from Europe, Asia, South America that are here and just Come here in amazement. Well, I'm amazed. I've been around. This is amazing. I get this feeling of just Bigfoot. 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 Boom, 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 boom. Did I see a jump in your future. Should I grab the wow. flare gun? You can jump that, dude. You can jump the gap at Bluff Creek. Why are you talking a little cash, man? Me and Bigfoot get paid to get seen. <laughs> <laughs> but let's, uh, when it gets dark, we're going to go Hit a couple trees, maybe see what. We got some thermal imagers. 
I'm good luck when it comes to seeing animals. I'm due. Let's go. <laughs> so you got two cowboys that could barely afford gas money. They had to borrow gas money to get down here. They were coming down to film Bigfoot tracks. Uh, they got a call from Al Hodgson up in Willow Creek saying there's some fresh tracks and the blogging roads. So they came here. Now look how rugged that is up there. You're telling me that two guys, two broke cowboys from Yakima, Washington, drove all the way down here. They went 25 miles up this rugged canyon to fake a monkey suit? Doesn't make any sense. No. But here's the other thing I wanted to bring you here for. Robbie, look. Ramp here. Ramp there. Jump left to Let me ask you. Guys came here and hiked years ago in 58? They didn't hike there. Put in the first roads ever up here. The first roads ever out there. So the guys came down here and they were, are you, what are you telling me? I'm just saying like, when people try to say, oh, they hoaxed it. Like, I don't, there's plenty of reasons you can show that they didn't hoax it just from the, what you see in the film. It's not a human. But why would they come to this rugged, rugged canyon? You go 25 miles up there to fake something. They could have had the guy wear a grill suit up in Washington. That's why I believe in uh, the Sasquatch, the Bigfoot, God's creation, uh, and the hideouts, and how fast they are, and how they're, they're like the most mysterious creature on the planet Earth. We have the ocean, the planet Earth. We have 10 zillion things in the ocean we'll never right. see. It's always intrigued me. The trees, the mountains, the best things in life are free. Water, trees, mountains. And you do not know what God created. I mean, he created us. I hate the darkness because I had an experience when I was a little kid. You're afraid of something? Well, I saw something that stuck in my mind forever. It was like a midget evil devil. And it looked like a teeny little Sasquatch. Standing under my great grandmother's tree and I dropped the dishes and I never forgot it. And I saw it. Like some people have seen aliens. Some people have seen spaceships. Some people have seen Sasquatches, right. Bigfoots. I saw this little dude that was like the most evil thing I ever seen. Like a mean little devil from hell. It looked like a spirit. I've had my feelings in the mountains, up in Washington on the Olympic Peninsula. I've heard my stories, I've heard everything, and I've heard about so many screams all around the country, all over the world, maybe. You can hear that. It's hard to see him, but you can hear him. I've heard about the screams. It's like, nobody can explain that. Nobody can lie about that. And the smell and everything else, when they want their territory, they, breathe, they have a smell that comes out of them in a skunk type of way, yeah. but it's a smell like any animal wanting to keep you away from everything. Right. The things I've heard through the years, living on the peninsula, all over the country in Canada, really. Let's, uh, I mean, you know, the creeks, the, the Sasquatch, the Bigfoot, perfect landscape. It's getting dark. Let's go hit some trees, do something. Light a fire, throw an apple out. I don't know. Let's go see if we can find a big. One. I got some buddies that we're gonna go meet up right now and do it. Let's do it, brother. We've seen the artifacts. We've heard from eyewitnesses. Now Bobo takes us to a secret location close by, known as a Bigfoot hotspot. We'll be meeting up with Robert and Rowdy as they show us what it takes to have an encounter of our own. He can't say, I seek Sasquatch. We are looking for the hairy men. Well, we're going 40 more miles north of Bigfoot Motel. Um, the clouds are coming in. There's a storm coming in, we know, and it's really cloudy, stormy looking right now. We might get to go out and Bigfoot hunt. Where are these guys at? They're just up ahead. We're a half mile away. Okay. Are they good? Keep going straight. Are you ready to do some squatching? I'm gonna go out and I'm gonna hoop so damn loud.
Robert about going and picking up some footage tonight from one of the Ridge Lakes. Any bears at least or mountain yeah. lions? Yeah, it looks like uh, there might be some bear on there. I kind of skimmed through it, but we'll, we'll check it out later too. And I'll show, show you some highlights from our Bluff Creek project, camera project. We got some cougars this year just in total heat. They're just horny for each other and screaming the whole time, man. We Was got it the bar or the mountain? No, we, we got it at the Patterson-Gimlin side. So we had a sequence of each of the cameras stimulating. So the male had to be younger, right, since he was a cougar? No, he looked a lot bigger. He, he looked probably 20 pounds, 30 pounds heavier than I'm sure he was younger because she's a cougar. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> I hope she, uh, uh, the cougar you get doesn't sound like that, man. That would wake up the whole neighborhood. If you're doing it right, she does. <laughs> So I heard you want to go out and do a little bit of squatching with us tonight. Squatching, watching. I've heard enough stories. I've believed everything because of my experiences. I've never seen a squatch. I want to see one. This will help. Tell me a story. <laughs> this got will a help. thermal imager right here. Ever seen one of these? Yeah. Registers heat. Like you see those cop videos where they look through the helicopter. You can check it out. Just don't look right at the fire, but check it. Look at the living. You can see what the living thing looks like. I could have used this uh, in the 80s. Oh, yeah. They're good all the time. Just okay. flats, because you never know. They, they sneak up around camp. I you. might not put it down uh, darkly. That's what you want. <laughs> Bobo's lucky enough to have seen a Sasquatch. Robert and I are still uh, waiting for our encounter one day. But honestly, it's the Patterson-Gimlin film. That's one of the things that we have in history that's actually on celluloid that could be an actual Bigfoot creature. And I think the importance of finding the site is to get all we can get out of the site, information-wise, the distances, where things walked, how things looked. You know, it's the mecca of places to go if you're into being a squatcher. And uh, we've, we've helped to probably bring the, the site to light yeah, so people that so. do want to go there can get there safely. and. Uh, and actually, if you, they go there with us, you get a pretty good preview of where Roger was, um, where Patty was when she was walking away. Uh, we have several different artifacts that are still there that are, were actually in the film. There's uh, fur stumps that are all over the place that we can point out. Uh, the trees in the background are still there. But here we are 50 years later, 52 years later, and it's turned into a complete forest. So it doesn't look really like it used to, but as the trees are getting bigger, um, the limbs are coming down, we can actually see through the forest again. It's the best piece of evidence, and it's the most controversial piece of evidence. So being able to establish the location again and measure the objects there, we did a 3D scan of the place. This guy, Bill Munns. These guys, well, I helped a little bit, but they cleared out two acres. They did a 3D scan, so you got a pretty precise measurement. So the estimates of our size went from 7476 down to 6465 around there. Who's bigger than Shaquille O'Neal, and I want to see a Bigfoot that's as big <laughs> as him or bigger? Here's the thing about the Patterson Gimlin film that's a female. And that's probably why she's not that big. The track, which we assume is probably a family member group, is the big first one from 1958 that Jerry Koo holding up, the very first one. They're, they're in that same little drainage right there together. Did you say Jerry Cooney? Jerry Crew. Jerry Cooney, the boxer? Yeah. <laughs> I love that guy. I do too, I know. I've had my feelings and my eerie feelings out in the middle of friggin' nowhere many times, mostly Washington on the peninsula. Very scary. Yeah. The Native American stories and all that, you know that and the smell and the screams in Sasquatch Bigfoot land of the land. What would you guys do? I mean, do you have any calling, certain noises, uh, strategies? They know we're here. 
they might come in and check us out. And that might give us an opportunity to look at them on the floor or hear them or something like that. I want to know what people want to know about Bigfoots that you guys can convince me that they want to know. That's what I want to know. The best thing to convince you to have your own experience, the best thing to do that is we should do some calls some loud calls and see if we can call them in. This is the expert yeah. caller. Adam 12, <laughs> pick up Knievel again. <laughs> do you want to go out and do some calls? I want to. Here's one of the ways we can attract Bigfoot. Some say, especially Bobo, that pounding a big old piece of wood on a big old piece of tree sounds through all up the canyon and probably brings in a Bigfoot. Why do you think that is, Bobo? There's only been two or three eyewitnesses that have actually seen them hitting a stick on a tree, but we've heard it numerous times. And the thought is they do it when there's people around so they can alert, alert each other where they are. They also have been observed doing it when they're like trying to sneak up on deer and position themselves when they pounce to get the deer out of the meadow. They'll knock so that so, so where they are. So it's like a it's a signal yeah. to, to the other Bigfoot. Yeah. Well, let's give it a try, man. Okay, I hit the tree. Now teach me how to do some calls or something. All right. Out here in the middle of the night. Yours need a little work. I like the effort, but you gotta have a little more kind of shit. I'll show you how to do it. This is what we call the Ohio House. It was recorded in 1995 back in Ohio. And it goes like. Let's get it. Make no mistake, this is dangerous territory. Let's talk to Rowdy about the Bluff Creek Project's excellent work videotaping wildlife in the area and the amazing footage that they've caught. So, Robbie, there's all these ways call in a Sasquatch, but to be honest with you, this is the only way we're going to find a Sasquatch. Is it daytime, good video image or a still image of a Sasquatch? That's why we have these cameras running 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, doing things that we can't do. We can't be in the woods all the time. So these game cameras are going to be the way that we're going to find Bigfoot. Here's a good example of a bear that somebody could mistake if they saw it at a glimpse. It could be a Bigfoot standing up. What we're doing is cataloging everything that's out in the wilderness in this area. And we've got a pretty extensive catalog so far. Um, we don't have Bigfoot yet, but this is the way I think we're gonna find one. Uh, these cameras have been there long enough so if there is any concern that Bigfoot uh, know and see a, a camera, these cameras have been there for eight years. So they've become a part of the environment. Seeing all the different animals that are out there, uh, we know what something sounds like, we know what it looks like, and we have a pretty good idea of how many animals are out there. So hopefully one day, the Bigfoot does walk in front of one of these cameras. We have these cameras down at the Patterson-Gimlin film site which is still the best piece of evidence that we have for Bigfoot. And that's what we hope to replicate with one of these cameras, is to see a Bigfoot walk in front of it. 
We've got just about every animal that's known in this area on these cameras. We've even gotten uh, a Humboldt Martin, which is considered extinct. We've got hundreds of videos now of this breeding pair. So in that sense, one day, there might be a chance that a Bigfoot will walk in front of our cameras. So Robbie, check out this Humboldt Martin. These things were thought extinct at one time, but our cameras at the Patterson-Gimlin site actually got several videos of a breeding pair there. This is what stimulates us to keep this going because someday, if we can get a Humboldt Martin, which is supposedly extinct, maybe we'll find a Bigfoot one day. Thanks for coming out, you know. Robert and I have really been doing a, a diligent job the past eight years now. Yeah, about eight years. And uh, the methodology and the consistency of putting these cameras out and making them work all the time may be the key to finding Bigfoot one day. So Robbie, I hope you had a good time and I hope you learned something about what it's gonna actually take to find Bigfoot. While we didn't see a Sasquatch that night, we learned that Willow Creek and Bluff Creek are still rampant with sightings. Hundreds of years and even recent encounters according to our eyewitnesses. It's fascinating because when you're here in this area and see the surroundings and the impossible heights that you'd have to be able to climb to get to the top of these mountains, which is humanly impossible, it all makes sense. So it's only a matter of time. The right equipment, persistence, and tenacity. I'm sure Bluff Creek Group will achieve the Holy Grail footage and no one deserves it more than they do. It's real, folks. There's way too many credible witnesses from all walks of life. They're describing the same thing and even noting nuances that each other doesn't know because they've never met or never shared. And when you begin to hear those similarities, you can tell what's a hoax, what's not a hoax, at least to the best of your ability. And when you realize that the sightings that they're talking about and they're describing are real, well, that just reveals that it's the biggest mystery of all time. Knievel, American legend, travels the globe, searching for answers to unsolved mysteries and legends. There are lights in the sky around Mount Shasta. Is it paranormal activity or aliens from outer space? Join us as Robbie Knievel explores the unknown on the next installment of Knievel's Quest as we seek the truth beneath the mysteries of Northern California's Shasta Lights. And when it gets dark, you better camp out with me. I'm gonna. See, this is your- Wanna go camping? Let's do it. <laughs> That's an old joke. Big foot 
like this. Okay. Well, uh, to be honest with you, I think it takes a bigger piece of wood and the right kind of tree to really get that sound that a Bigfoot could actually create by swinging and hitting something. So I don't know if that cane would quite do it. So you give it a try, man. Like a dad tap or a, just a tap? No, like you're like gonna hit it, fall out of the park. Fuck dad. <laughs> that's, that's that's your dad's revenge right there, buddy. That's your dad's revenge, dude. <laughs> One walks up and slaps me in the face. <laughs> Would you rather they slapped you somewhere else? <laughs> On the ass, whatever. Oh, yeah. I heard a Bigfoot scream in daylight down here one time. There's, most of the Bigfoot action happens down here for the most part. It's in the north end of the valley. We call the Bigfoot Highway.